So first of all, it has to be data oriented in that sense. It has to be something that um, is a spreadsheet, is a database, is something like that. Um, and obviously it has to come from an appropriate source. Uh, so once you have that, then we're looking at, looking at that data and we're trying to think, okay, obviously no one wants to read a 200 page report. Nobody wants to be handed a giant spreadsheet and be like, here, look at this and try and figure out what's going on, right? Like that's just not the way that people operate, right? So people, um, people are looking for something that catches their eye um, because the first thing that you have to do is you have to win their attention, right? So we have to figure out what is the thing that's going to catch their eye. And once you have their attention, what do you, what do you hit them with, right? So we're looking for facts, we're looking for data that stands out in that way. And once we have the, the item that we think can do that, then we, we build a framework around that. Um, we build an, a media angle around that. Um, so it's all about winning people's attention, holding their attention. Um, once you have their attention, you have to hit them with something that delivers insight and, and it gets them to keep reading and, and keep looking. And so we're, we're really just building a process around that. So we're looking at that to try and um, create that or stimulate that curiosity in people so that you have this fact or you have this um, initial vi visualization that captures people's attention and gets them to want to learn more and gets them it, rather than being stuck in your bubble and and just you know consuming what is coming your way you actually want to actively seek out more information so that you can learn more on the subject for me and from our company's perspective our, our view is basically like we're trying to take things that are complex and make them simple. Generally speaking, it's about stuff that's future looking. Um, and it's stuff that relates to, if you're an investor, it's your portfolio, or if you're in business, it's your company's future. If you're an entrepreneur, it's um, how you need to build your business for the future or you know that kind of stuff, right? So it's like, what, what can we help people with in terms of the decisions they make now with respect to their future. So the speed of technological change is important. The speed of economic change is important. So like, um, is GDP per capita increasing or decreasing and why? Uh, is trade increasing or decreasing? Um, so looking at those factors. Business segments generally, right? Um, so is this particular industry taking off? Uh, something like cannabis, right? Is this industry taking off or is it you know, going to hit a lull? And so people are trying to figure out what opportunities there are in the future based on these um, you know, emerging industries or emerging countries or, or what have you. And you have to know if they're for real or not. So yeah, it's the rate of change, but it's a, a, across a wide spectrum of different categories. Because that's it's something that's measurable. And it's also something that we can visualize, right? So uh, from that perspective, that, and that's kind of like, yeah, that's the number one thing that we'd be looking at. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site in the beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. We are now going to be talking about data visualization and so much more. We have Jeff Desjardins joining us on the show. Hi, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the program. I'm so pumped for our conversation. Jeff is founder and editor-in-chief at Visual Capitalist, which is a digital media company that exclusively publishes rich visual content on investing in business. With annual user growth doubling each year, Visual Capitalist reaches over 2 million people per month with clients such as McKinsey, BlackRock, the UN, and the World Bank. Whew. I love what you guys do. I love the way you make these rich data visualizations. It is so important to take the complexity of this world that we find ourselves in and try and make it relatable for people and to try and inspire them towards their own self-actualization, towards our 
eradication of ignorance, and you guys do that, and you do it across a myriad of fields, which is another thing that I find super inspirational, as our show is very polymathic like that as well. Jeff, this has been going on nine years now. You guys have covered such a wide array of topics. You guys have 21 people in staff, designers, researchers. I mean, it's so cool seeing what you guys have produced. So I want to start things off by asking you about how you guys even find what to figure out to show in the complexity of the world. There's so many things, there's so much information, actually being able to structure that and disseminate it. Teach us about that style of process and also how it changed from nine years ago until now. Yeah, wow. Uh, So I I think that that process started as something that was really more of a gut instinct than anything else. Uh, So when we started and how we got to where we are today, it was kind of finding things that we thought were particularly interesting or that really help people get that little bit of insight that could be either, you know, water cooler talk at the office or it's the thing that inspires them to do the next big thing, right? And getting people to have that little tidbit of information that they can now talk about, whether it's, you know, that fact or that insight or or whatever it is, um, you know, we want to deliver that on a daily basis to people. And so that's, it's changed over time, which is weird. Um, it was very intuitive to begin with, and we were just kind of looking at what was catching our eye, what, what was something that were like, when you heard that fact, you're like, wow, that's something that uh, really inspired me or got me to think. And over time, we've been working to codify how we come up with that, and because now we have a bigger team, and so we have other people that have to be coming up with this stuff on a daily basis as well. It can't be me or uh, someone like Nick Routley, who's our, our managing editor, we can't be coming up with it all the time. We have to be, it has to be something that's systemic uh, throughout the organization where we're all looking for that kind of information. Um, so how has that changed over time and, and what is it like today? Um, that's an interesting question. And I think that probably um, the best way to do it would be to think about it in terms of, uh, of data, which is how we always think about things, right? So. Um, things that are, are very qualitative or things that are opinions or things that are um, not looking at it from a, a quantifiable, independent perspective, uh, for those items, they just don't really work with our process. So first of all, it has to be data-oriented in that sense. It has to be something that um, is a spreadsheet, is a database, is something like that, um, and obviously it has to come from an appropriate source. Uh, so once you have that, then we're looking at looking at that data and we're trying to think, okay, obviously no one wants to read a 200 page report. Nobody wants to be handed a giant spreadsheet and be like, here, look at this and try and figure out what's going on, right? Like that's just not the way that people operate, right? So people, um, people are looking for something that catches their eye um, because the first thing that you have to do is you have to win their attention, right? So we have to figure out what is the thing that's gonna catch their eye. And once you have their attention, what do you, what do you hit them with, right? So we're looking for facts, we're looking for data that stands out in that way. And once we have the, the item that we think can do that, then we, we build a framework around that. Um, we build an, a media angle around that. Um, so it's all about winning people's attention, holding their attention. Um, once you have their attention, you have to hit them with something that delivers insight and, and it gets them to keep reading and, and keep looking. And so we're, we're really just building a process around that. I love how you put it from the perspective of this. In, when, you di- when you give them some sort of data visualization, it's about catalyzing some sort of inspiration or further awakening or realization that then makes it fun for them to go and share it with other people to say that, hey, I now know this. It's become part of my knowledge base. And now I share it with other people and they go, wow, I didn't know that. And it makes for a more aware world, a more uh, factual world, a world where ignorance can decrease at a more rapid rate and collective uh, uh, objective knowledge can increase at a more rapid pace, which is extremely needed. And then I also like how you put it, how through the evolution of visual capitalists, there's there's been a process where uh, you guys have to figure out 
it's been, you know, you you are a part of the attention economy as as are we, and and it's it's not only you know people see that you're here to catalyze that inspiration and that awakening, so they want to work with you, they want to watch what you're doing, but furthermore, is you do have to figure out how to make it so that this. Um, this hundred page report on a specific topic, you do what we do in many ways, which is you have to parse it for the most profound, most awakening stats. And then you have to visualize, you have to visually represent it for people in a way where they go, wow, that was good. And there's so many different ways to visually represent it. And I would love for you to actually explain um, those ways as, uh, as many people just see like uh, pie charts as like such a common mathematical representation, uh, bar graphs. There's uh, many of these different ways to represent um, data. Um, and uh, infographics have become really popular where it's, you know, multiple uh, percentages with visualizations along the way. And um, so, Let's have you explain the process of when you do encounter something that's super profound and awakening. You want to then parse it. You want to then uh, uh, represent that data. And how do you pick what medium to represent it as? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, the answer really varies uh, depending on what type of information it is and, and what the subject matter is and, and how you want to get that message out to people. So for us... Lately, we're trending towards uh, doing things that are more, I mean, in the social media world, uh, where you're just looking at a, something on Instagram or some, a tweet or whatever. Like, you really need to capture people's attention with that thing. You can't expect something that's kind of, um, you know, just a, a part of something bigger to be what drives people in to read more and implores them to... Um, to examine a, a topic deeper. So what we're looking for is, is, first of all, what is that one tidbit that we can pull that's going to capture people's attention? Um, to do that, I think that it's really an examination of what, what fact is going to be something that triggers something in, in someone's mind, um, that triggers insight or gets them thinking, or it's something that they've never heard before. Um, and, and to figure that out, you have to re really have a good sense of the media environment. You have to have a sense of who your audience is. Um, and, and as I said, at first, that was a gauge that was fairly um, intuitive that you know I was operating on, which was like, OK, I think that our audience is going to be really surprised to learn that, for example, um, the median age uh, on all continents, when you look at that, the median age of Africa is 18 years old. 18 That's years a crazy old. fact, right? Yes, yes. And you know, when you look at something like that, I, for me, it just jumps off the page. And I'm like, if we show this in, in an appropriate way, uh, for example, the way that we did show that is we used um, you know, colors to represent the scale of median age across all the different continents. And of course, Africa stands out by its col color. And compared to about 35 or so as the right. median and, age. Right, and the Europe is even older. It's uh, in the 40s. And so you have this color spectrum where everything is, yeah, 30s and 40s, and then you have one that clearly stands out. And so we're thinking about it not only in terms of that, the, the fact that um, is important, but also like when we visualize it, how are we going to pull that out and uh, what devices can we use, which as you alluded to, you know, we, we have a variety of different um, you know, visual things that we can leverage. So like, are we putting this in a specific type of chart or are we using a map or are we using a particular color, sch uh, color scheme that's going to help us show this thing? Um, what are the different elements of storytelling that we can uh, yes. implore to tell this, right? So are we, uh, is it going to be a, a narrative or is it going to be something that has, um, you know, characters or archetypes, or like, what, how are we going to actually show this uh, from a storytelling perspective as well? So we were trying to put all these different pieces to the pu of the puzzle together, and at the end of the day, if we do it right and if we do it the best possible way, it's going to be, uh, in the case of that, um, the map on median age, it's going to be something that stands out, and you're like, holy crap! I now see that you know, I've, I've not only have you learned this fact about Africa, but it actually um, really 
um, tickles your imagination, and now you're like, okay, well, what does that mean for the world? Yes. What does that uh, mean for the future of um, society? And what does that mean for the for our perspective? What does that mean for the future of business? Um, so we're looking at that to try and um, create that or stimulate that curiosity in people so that you have this fact or you have this um, initial vi visualization that captures people's attention and gets them to want to learn more and gets them it, rather than being stuck in your bubble and and just you know consuming what is coming your way you actually want to actively seek out more information so that you can learn more on the subject I really appreciate how you take something that can be written as a fact of Africa, mid median age, 18, and just have that be just a message that goes out, which maybe has a, uh, a chance of, 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 of sticking in people's essence uh, at uh, maybe one or two in 10, let's say, whatever, just as a, as a, let's play with these numbers. But then when you add the actual visualization component of showing that they are the color, let's say, light green uh, on the on the map, and then uh, you have these colors of like like darker red in Europe and U.S. and the Americas, Asia, etc. And then you and then people see that wow, and then you have that spectrum that shows them that grade that gradient that of coloration. Um, it 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 lands it maybe in three out of. Uh, 10 or 4 out of 10 people just with the visual um, in addition to it. So you're already, um, you know... With the text. With the text, exactly. The visual plus the text can land it in more people's essences. It will make it uh, better for them to retain it, share it with people down the line. Um, so that component being crucial. And then also um, there is a... Um, there's a... Uh, a, s a storytelling component to it, which is it's maybe not only about selling it logically, but selling it emotionally. And so it's kind of like, can you pair together the brain with the heart? And I really like this way of viewing it because it can be in a sense, uh, something along the lines of, you know, Africa's median age being 18 and then comma, uh, how do we, how 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 can we uh, uh, how 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 are they going to catalyze the future? Something like that, which right. yeah, which then kind of gets people excited about. Well, interesting. Well, then, wh well, how are they going to catalyze the future? Then, how is that big imagination explosion going to affect the rest of our world? And then that kind of hits the heart side of things. Right, hitting both sides is really important, right? Because it's all about how people learn and absorb information. And the truth is, is that we do it in so many different ways and people are all very different, right? Um, so we know, and it, it's our business, that you know, 65% of people are visual learners, right? And so that's the majority of people. And our thought process is that the majority of people are actually not getting most of their information in the way that's best for them to learn, which is actually really tragic, right? Yeah. Um, if we want everybody to learn and to uh, pick up as much information as possible, it needs to be in a format that they're going to pick it up in. And if all we're giving them is like, here's a long report, read it. Man, we've all been to high school, right? How many people in high school are, are, are people that are going to learn that way, right? A lot of people learn by doing. A lot of people learn by visuals. A lot of people will learn by audio, a podcast, right? So you have to have different things in different formats for people. And so for us, it's about stimulating that visual format for that, that large chunk of the population that needs to learn that way. And you're right, you can add in other elements to it. It doesn't have to be purely data. Um, data can be a tool, and it can be a really powerful tool. In a lot of situations, it might not be the best way to lead a story. Uh, other ways, um, or like maybe you want to create context around something, and data isn't the appropriate way to do it. Maybe it's instead a narrative or storytelling, or maybe it's asking a question. Yeah. Yes, I like that. So then the combination of the, of the stat with the combination of the visualization with the combination of the story, the heart uh, component could land in five out of ten people's, uh, yeah, and it could resonate with that many more people just by, um, uh, by curating the content in a way that um, 
catalyzes the deepest amount of awareness shift, which is ideally um, what we uh, want to see happen with the content um, around the world and creating more signal. I mean, we talk about this so much on the program, but just the importance of taking these hour-long conversations and compressing them into knowledge graphs uh, and having one for every single episode. These are things that we want to do as we scale and that by doing that, you have this medium that is okay if you do want to watch an hour-long conversation on the subject do it if you want to explore the couple minute uh infographic knowledge graph on what was discussed it's there as well there's a highlight reel of a couple minutes and so you have all these different ways of of exploring the content in that subject because maybe you only want to watch the five minute highlight reel on the biotech episode but then you want to watch the um, the whole hour on the data visualization, but then you only want to read the infographic on the blockchain conversation that happened last week. So that's another uh, big part to this, which I think, you know, you guys do add your, you know, you add a good amount of story. Is it on every single one of the um, posts that you make? You add, yep. yeah, your own uh, researchers and visualizers um, have a body of text in exactly. addition. Yeah. Yeah, and one other interesting thing about that as well is um, when you're looking at um, producing a piece of content, as you know, um, it's not only about uh, that big piece of content, it's about chopping it up and creating different ways to access that content. And what's really um, useful, I think, about some of the stuff that we're able to do is we're able to take something that is like a 200-page report somewhere else, condense it into that five-minute read, and then... You know, if someone wants to just like, okay, I don't want to commit all this time to reading this giant report, but I can commit five minutes to read this quick infographic that explains this complex subject. The great thing about that is that you're hopefully going to stimulate, you know, a percentage of that population that's looking at that. And they're going to be like, you know what, actually, I might want to read the larger report because this is a subject I'm now interested in. And I'm now, I now have that, um, I'm now an active learner and I want to go and learn more about it. Yeah, yep. Man, this, is, this has so much to do with uh, efficacy of knowledge dissemination. Um, I love that. Um, and we have a lot to, um, to explore as well um, that I'm looking forward to talking to you guys um, about um, after our convo. Um, I, wanna, I wanna touch on, um, there seems to be so much knowledge to pick to condense and further disseminate and given the sheer breadth and depth that has been unleashed with the information technology age how are you guys even picking yeah uh <laughs> so so where can you start on that question right yeah. it's um, I mean, the reason that we exist in the first place is, um, is I think that there is a lot of, not only a lot of information and topics to cover, but there's also a general clutter of information as, or misinformation or, or whatever you want to call it, stuff that is not actually super useful. And um, so where we start? So I, I think that for me and from our company's perspective, our, our view is basically like we're trying to take things that are complex and make them simple. Generally speaking, it's about stuff that's future looking. Um, and it's stuff that relates to, if you're an investor, it's your portfolio, or if you're in business, it's your company's future. If you're an entrepreneur, it's um, how you need to build your business for the future or you know that kind of stuff, right? So it's like, what, what can we help people with in terms of the decisions they make now with respect to their future? And so the things that we choose are, 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 are things that we think can play into that. Um, so uh, for example, if you're an investor, how the demographics of the world are shifting in the long term actually is a really important thing for you, right? It affects everything because that means everything from the, um, you know, the amount of old people versus young people is gonna play a role in terms of um, the solvency of governments Right? If you have too many dependents and not enough working population, that's going to create all kinds of problems. Right? Or 
Uh, if you have a ton of young people and few old people, that's also going to play out in your economy as well. So this is going to have different impacts in different places. Or um, you know, as far as demographics go, things like immigration and things like that have an impact too. So understanding what's happening globally with that will empower you to make better decisions as an investor. Or if you're uh, if you're leading a company, you're also going to start, you also need to know what's going on with that too, right? Because um, what your next move is is going to depend on uh, like, do I move into the Indian market? Do I move into um, the German market, like you need to have a sense of what's happening there, right? And mm -hmm. and so uh, the future looking um, aspect there is really important. So you know, demographics is an example of a topic that we weigh into a lot, um, but there's many others as well. Um, but the the ultimate question is like, how how does this topic? Is it something that's uh, applicable on a on a global basis to people that they need to to know for this stuff? Um, is it something that is going to have profound effects on doing business or making decisions? Um, is it something that you can do something about? Uh, because you know, if it's something that's changing and you can't actually make changes in your life or portfolio to deal with it, then it's kind of a moot point. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're looking at those those kind of things to try and figure out what are these forces that we're going to uh, that are going to influence the future, and then what is what are, what is the data around those forces that is the most poignant. Whoa. All right. So we have where you started us off with uh, taking what is the continuation of our initial earlier conversations about having this objective dissemination of crucial knowledge that is completely against the streams of misinformation, propaganda, um, and uh, I mean, the Internet Research Agency, right? There's all of these places that have um, uh, deep roots in trying to disseminate things that are, uh, in a sense, evil or bad or trying to catalyze harm in some ways. And then you have these great sources that need to be tried to, you know, propped up onto pedestals around the world. And we like talking about, yes, you know, visual capitalist, yes, our show, yes, in a nutshell. There's all these other great channels that are trying to do their absolute best to get you um, awakening, content around awakening that's, you know, really, really solid um, data that's being compressed and, and shared with you. But then this next point that you bring up, which is that how do you do things like show where entrepreneurs or, or scientists or artists or other people from around the world, investors, where, how can you show them what is coming up that is exciting next? And because it's not only about showing these trends from where you see you know 2020 heading where you see the future heading in the roaring 2020s that we're about to approach with all of the inf um the the internet of, internet of things blockchain and crypto neurotech biotech ar vr i mean it's all over the place quantum computing where things are heading and so you gotta you know show them that angle so you have to be aware of all of those different fields and how they're changing the landscape, but also like you indicated, demographics, am I gonna be taking my company next or making in, uh, investments next into Germany or India? And, and how do I know based on the demographics in those regions? And something that's also complex to know is that you, you do have to have some sort of an idea of the zeitgeist of those countries because our in India, a lot of young people right now are using a very Gen Z-esque platform called TikTok. And so you got to know like, well, maybe it's important to teach the companies that are trying to market into India about uh, how to make 15 second videos. Dancing videos. Dancing videos. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, uh, this whole process you got to know about the zeitgeist of that country 
I mean, there's so many things. There's, of course, there's, you know, there's um, Hinduism and there's Sikhism and there's, there's all of these, you know, um, also spiritual and religious sorts of things that are also very important to consider. What are the main exports of Germany versus the main exports or imports of these countries of India? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information to take into consideration, right? The, I mean, we don't really see ourselves as um, a group that's trying to get all of that information in, in one place. I think that's um, more of a Wikipedia or you know, Google's mission or something like that, right? Um, but what I think we can do is I think we can, um, we can add some pressure and, and you know, pull on that lever that gets people looking in the right place, right? We can, we can help people find, uh, you know, when you're looking at um, an 80-20 rule or something like that for like, of all the things that you mentioned about India and Germany, which of those things actually matter, right, for yeah. someone that's looking at making an investment or going into business there, right? There's certain things, that 20% that's gonna make the 80% of the difference, right? So we can, we can use our um, ability to parse information and to visualize it and to, to hopefully show some of those areas that are particularly interesting. That's like, this, this is what matters here. Um, and you should try and learn more. But before you do anything else, you should learn more about that. So we can direct people into the right places by highlighting information um, that is particularly poignant. Yeah, I like the focus on that. Um, Pareto, that 80-20, that's so crucial. Well, you um, can't do everything, yeah. right? And, you, and also, if we try to go too far into the weeds, then people are going to be like, well, what are, you, like, what are you talking about, right? You're talking about um, this random subject in this random country, and it doesn't really have an effect on my day-to-day -day life, or it doesn't have an effect on my future necessarily. So you have to, we have to figure out which of these, um, which of these items are going to be the most interesting and most compelling to people, and also what's going to have the biggest effect on the future. Okay, so given the subject of business and investing and demographics of a rapidly changing information technology world, where, what do you guys look for in terms of signal, in terms of the, that 20% that you're going to visualize for people? Yeah, I think generally speaking, the best signals are going to be, are going to be business signals, right? So um, growth. Uh, like the rate of change of something. So the rate of change of population is going to be very linked to um, what kinds of opportunities are going to be there and, and what kind of, um, you know, and what's happening in the business world there, right? A, a, a country that's depopulating is going to be a very different situation than a country that is gr uh, doubling in population, right? Um, or, so, so percentage growth is one thing, obviously. Um, I think um, oh, rate of automation? Is sure, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if you're looking at it from the technological point of view, um, the rate of automation is going to be a big component of that. When you look at um, places like Korea or uh, Japan or, or what have you, I mean, it's, it's going to be ultimately a very different society and situation um, than it is going to be in somewhere that's where everything is manually done, right? Um, and so those have different implications for investors and for business people. Um, and, and for people and for society at large, right? Yeah, so when looking at business, it seems like your number one is population. Well, well, like demographics, rate of, yeah, rate of change in Yeah, rate of change, of that, general, right? rate of change in general, right? Rate of change in general. Okay, I see. Yeah. So number one is rate of change, and then under rate of change is kind of like demographics. Correct. Yeah, different categories. Different categories. So rate of change is kind of like demographics because people are uh, the most, in a sense, valuable uh, way of understanding rate of change. Um, like, again, is population decreasing or increasing? What is the rate of change that it is increasing or decreasing at? Because these are the people that are going to be engaged in the world, um, that are going to be the ones that are trying to create more value in that country, that are going to be bringing their ideas into that country, um, et cetera, into the world. So then there's that um, as a measurement of like economic success and stuff like that. But then the next thing that could be under this rate of change is like how quickly um, Technology is evolving in that country. Correct. Yeah. So, so the speed of technological change is important. The speed of economic change is important. So, like, um, is GDP per capita increasing or decreasing, and why? Uh, is trade increasing or decreasing? 
Um, so looking at those factors, business segments generally, right? Um, so is this particular industry taking off? Uh, something like cannabis, right? Is this industry taking off, or is it you know going to hit a lull? And so people are trying to figure out what opportunities there are in the future based on these um, you know emerging industries or emerging countries or or what have you. And you have to know if they're for real or not. So yeah, it's the rate of change, but it's a, a, across a wide spectrum of different categories because that's it's something that's measurable, and it's also something that we can visualize, right? So. Uh, from that perspective, that and that's kind of like, yeah, that's the number one thing that we'd be looking at. Yeah, I like the ways of visualizing where uh, emerging markets are heading because it gives us both a insight into the importance of figuring out the best ways, I think, to democratize the fruits of those emerging markets. Um, otherwise, we have the same uh, scenarios where uh, over 50% of all new wealth that is created goes to the top 1%, which is this continuous process um, that we're uh, all experiencing, but then we don't mimic nature uh, in the sense that these large trees are sequestering carbon and nutrients and then distributing them across roots and fungal systems to smaller trees and seedlings, um, that same process is very clearly not happening um, in our wealth inequality scenario. And so I really like this idea of can we get more people to figure out ways of microfinancing the emerging uh, markets and then having it so that people can just put $100 into those emerging markets and then um, get the fruits from that or have inclusive stakeholding as the social contract that makes it so that um, environments and cities and future generations actually get um, pieces of the pie um, as well. I like how you talked about you know GDP and trade in that sense, um, which are economic measurements, uh, but they are also um, don't necessarily take into account the um, the measurement of someone's uh, spiritual enlightenment or their own. Um, uh, well-being um, and health. Um, uh, so, so this is also tough because we want to try and visualize components like that. So uh, this is why we talk about on the program that something along the lines of, uh, of that that takes the, the, the full biometric readout of, of your level of spiritual enlightenment, which may be something around EEG, EKG, your microbiome, etc., um, and could potentially give us an idea of how many of these 1,500 billionaires and global ruling elite that run countries and the big companies, etc., how many of them actually uh, have a deep sense of interconnectedness, of unconditional love, of deep presence, um, versus uh, egotistical tendencies and self-dealing tendencies. And so I'd love to see data being visualized in that regard as well because it's great to see yes investing yes business yes um, at the same time uh, can we also see the level of uh, spiritual actualization that this planet has and the deep uh, importance of that moving forward to make sure there's less suffering to make sure there's more sharing and more love and compassion yeah, so one interesting area of overlap is that, and I don't think I would equate it to, you know, that, that spiritual element 100%, but I do think that, like, we do visualize a lot of data around things like happiness, right? So, um, and, I, and I think happiness is going to be as sort of, it's as universal of a measure of that stuff as you can have. Because I think when you talk about spirituality, I think people are going to think about that in different ways, right? People of uh, different religious faiths, or um, people that are, um, you know, people on the um, meditation side of things. I think all of these people will interpret that as a as a different kind of thing, right? Uh, whereas I think happiness is a pretty universal thing, where you can say, okay, are you happy? Yes or no, right? Um, and I think whether you talk to someone from Guatemala or if you talk to someone from Russia, like, are you happy or sad? I think 
even given different cultures and, and language, I think these are going to be fairly, it's not going to be perfect, but it'll be fairly universal terms, right? Um, and so what's interesting is that um, we have looked at things like what are the happiest countries in the world? Um, what relation is there between happiness and wealth or, or GDP per capita? Things like that. And, you know, it's not, um, it's not going all of the way to what you're, what you're suggesting, but it's a way to, it's a framework to help begin to understand it and to understand it from a perspective that at least has that um, somewhat quantifiable aspect to it. And, um, and there's some really interesting results, actually, which is that um, in terms of GDP per capita, right, which is the um, amount of economic production per person in a country, um, that's actually linked to happiness uh, up till a certain point, right? So once you get people to a certain point, a certain amount of uh, GDP per capita, that actually raises their happiness levels significantly. And this clean, is this clean is, water. This is obvious, right? Shelter, I mean, yeah. food. When you think of basic. it, it's pretty obvious, right? Which is like exactly having access to the most basic things, the most essential things, um, the very like bottom parts of the sort of like um, pyramid of of needs, right? That you you have to go through, uh, like Maslow's hierarchy kind of thing. I mean, like if you can provide those basic things, that's going to get you to sort of like a uh, medium level of contentness. And then after that, it's, a, as you know, it's like self-actualization and things like that that are going to be sort of that next thing that you have to get to, right? So that's, that's where things start splitting off, right? Which is like, once you get to that minimum level of, of happiness that, um, that you can get to from material stuff, now this giant spectrum of countries that are all over the place in terms of happiness and some that, um, that like, actually punch above their weight and, and many that punch below their weight respective to where they are on the economic spectrum. Latin America actually is, um, is really well known uh, for punching above their weight in terms of like their happiness level is much higher than you would predict based on GDP, um, per, on capita. GDP per capita, which is interesting because then you have to ask yourself what kind of cultural norms and what kind of trends in exactly. Latin America are contributing to that. Are there things we can learn from that and exactly. apply to other cultures um, and or your own life, right, to be happier? Yeah, versus the, and also the seeing the opposite where uh, GDP per capita can be high, but levels of happiness and well-being are low, right. which makes it feel like there's something about the... It means there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect and the uh, the matrix environments that we've built, uh, uh, I think, may be the ones uh, to 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 blame in that sense. Because um, you know, looking behind um, this this backdrop of of that that we have on the on the program today, um, we have the concrete jungle of Van downtown Vancouver here. And um, as beautiful as it is to have these wealth creation machines that are cities. Um, we also understand deeply that there are literally, um, if you think about nature per capita in metropolises, um, it's, va it's, 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 it's shit, it's, it's crap, it's bad, it's poor, it's, it's very low. Um, we don't have our beautiful um, interconnection and interdependence with, with water present here, with trees, with animals, with other plants. Um, with the things that we are deeply interconnected with. That's why um, uh, light pollution, so we can't see our beautiful stars. Um, it, th there are so many aspects to this that um, take us away from the, um, from the, the, the happiness and the well-being so that it makes it seem like, yes, we can take these things from, you know, why, what are the philosophies, the morals, and the ethics of places like uh, Latin America, where they have a higher level of happiness and well-being than um, their uh, GDP per capita indicates. Well, what can we find out from that? But also, what can we find out from uh, areas that have lower levels of 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 happiness and well-being? And I think that um, it's probably feelings of a lack of self-actualization, lack of, of feelings of separation, lack of feelings of interconnectedness. Being stuck in a day-to-day -day grind, basically, yep. I think, is a big factor as well. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people in cities, regardless of whether you're in New York or whether you're in 
um, San Antonio. I think that it's a lot of people that live in cities are, are sort of on that. Um, how do you how do you escape that day to day? Okay, you wake up, go to work, do your thing, come back, turn on TV, go to bed, wake up, go to work, do your thing. Um, that's hard, right? Um, how do you escape that? So I, I think that's totally a, a question that's worth asking, which is what is the what what are the ways on both sides of the spectrum? Why is Latin America happier than it would you would guess, and why are certain places uh, and certainly in in Western economies. Uh, there are certain ones where they're less happy than you would e expect. Yeah. What are the differences? What is the delta? And and what if you can determine what those things are culturally? Yes. yes. Uh, then there's something that you can do. You can apply that information. Yes. Yes. I mean, this speaks again very highly to the importance of figuring out these variables that are influencing. Um, uh, the specific trends that we're talking about in this last point. And it does take a lot of skill. Um, it takes a lot of uh, nuance. It takes a lot of multivariability analysis. You can't um, try and uh, uh, think in binary terms here. Um, there is, uh, uh, you can't have cognitive bias uh, or cognitive ease um, happening. This is this is this is going to take a lot of cognitive resources and a lot of patience. Um, uh, it it feels a, a lot like um, uh, I, I relate this point a lot to um, um, archaeology uh, and, and anthropology in the sense that uh, we have very deep species amnesia. Um, we, we we struggle with understanding that um, you know just a hundred years ago um, we discovered uh, the the code of Hammurabi right we just discovered something that's almost 4,000 years old um, that gives us uh, a deep understanding of the first primordial ideas of constitution and what it was like to try and codify uh, 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 an evolving city of people and um, think about how many more things like that are buried across the planet. And so it's going to take a long time for us to focus our resources on excavating out those specific things in order for us to gain a better nuanced and multivariate view of what our species was actually like in the evolutionary process. And so if you're on the feeds every single day and you're looking at these instant posts from seven minutes ago someone posts some news article you know, really think about how much time they spent excavating out the data from that because the 24 7 news cycle and the clickbaity-esque mentalities of the attention economy business plans are not focused on nuance and multivariability in the gray area and what's going to take you more cognitive resources and what's going to take them more time to research and visualize. Whereas places like visual capitalist simulation, we're trying to do our best to take that, that longer period of time to come up with the most important gray area and nuance and visualize it in ways that make you uh, have a better understanding of the reality that we're in. Th those are two, th that in a sense is black and white. That is very binary, the difference between those two things. Of course there is some gray area, but really it's like, do, do, are your sources that you're looking at today deeply nuanced, complex, taking their time, visualizing it in a specific way, or are they just trying to feed you something that you click on in a 24-7 news cycle? You know, I looked through your YouTube uh, feed and I was a little bit um, surprised. I didn't find any outrage in there. Um, you know, I, that's how you get clicks. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but uh, I, I was looking through and I was a little bit uh, disappointed to see that clearly you don't understand today's uh, modern economy. Um, but yes, no, I mean, if you're not, uh, if you're not geared towards um, that and if you're not geared towards those clicks, then um, hopefully you're you're on the other side. and you know I think we found a bit of a way to I think we've been lucky in the, in the way that we've been able to sort of hack that side of things which is like that the nuanced complex 
um, hard to understand. That side of the coin is the way worse end to be on if, if you're trying to make a business of it, right? Yeah. It's really hard. And, uh, and I think that you have to use everything you have in your toolkit to get that information out in a way that actually has some element of you know, word of mouth spread to it or um, you capture someone's I imagination. Want to take this analogy where you like you take what you basically uh, created as this beautiful uh, 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 data representation, sure. like nuanced yep. data representation at Visual Capitalist, but then what you do is this multivariate long process that you took with this, you find again just like the best way to to storytell it and given the attention economy, yes. um, given that what is the one uh, graphic that we want to add to the post, what is the one sentence that Correct. hits both brain and heart yeah. on the post. Yeah. And, and we say that when we when we develop stuff too, right? Because we our um, writers spend so much time figuring out um, you know the topic that they're they go through all the research, they go through all the topic, and then you have our um, our design side, and they so spend so much time designing the whole thing. But at the end of the day, there's this, uh, there is this information economy element to it, which is like, I, I always tell them that like 50% of the like outcome of a post that we're creating is basically going to be determined by what is the title of the post, what is the, the image that shows up when you see it on an email blast or in social media or whatever, and what is your description of that, right? And it's sad to say, but that those three things have a huge... Um, you know, determ they, they determine the predictability of like whether this thing is going to have a million views or whether it's going to have 10,000 views. And, um, you know, in our business, we want to skew things towards getting more eyeballs on things than fewer, right? And of course, we do a lot of things because we just find them interesting and we want to get some eyeballs on them as well, right? But um, so trying to, how do you, how do, you do that balance, right? Um, and, and so the way that we frame something is hugely important um, in, in terms of getting eyeballs on that so that more people can learn about that subject. And yeah, it's hard. And uh, it's one of the ways that we've been able to sort of hack into the, um, that it's not the outrage side of things, but it's certainly the attention span, yeah. social media side of things, um, which I, I think that yeah, people want to be outraged, and people find ways to be outraged about our things, anyways. Even though they're like very data driven, um, which actually is one of the most mind boggling things that we experience on a day to day basis. Because we get emails all over the place. It's like, why did you color this country this color? And like, don't you know that this color represents something? It's like, okay, well, whatever. I don't know. Like, it's just a color scheme, right? Um, so there's all kinds of uh, funny stuff there, but. No, I mean, we, but we try and hack it the best that we can so that we can get some of the best of both worlds, right? Maybe um, in a way it's uh, viewing maybe <clears throat> some of the more uh, cancerous uh, essences of the attention economy um, as one a uh, disgusting way of doing it. And then it's viewing um, some of the more, uh, uh, these are like strategic, it's tactfulness is what it is. It's, <coughs> it's, uh, it's, it's compression, it's synthesis and dissemination. Um, and rather than a clickbaity, cancerous uh, uh, manipulation propaganda, um, on this side, it's like we're trying to uh, catalyze enough enlightenment um, around the world that eradicates suffering faster, that increases objective truth faster, that makes it so that people are able to um, uh, collectively prosper faster. And so that's um, the side that we're coming at. And I, I, I like being able to distinctively um, view those things because um, I think it's becoming very clear very fast that people are uh, experiencing the death of mainstream media uh, and the rise of independent media, but it has to be uh, uh, not only, yes, being catalyzed by the, the, it is being catalyzed by the giants of distribution in many ways, but um, to uh, be able to patron those independent media organizations, if you do believe in them, uh, is very important. Um, visual capitalist just 
you guys just sold out your first book, Visualizing Change, which is epic that you guys had a sellout for the first book. But um, you and I were talking about this before starting. You have a new book coming out in 2020 yep. as well, which we're very pumped for. Um, but we were just talking about this before we started. All of that data from Visualizing Change was from 2018. Um, and what happens in the exponential technology information age is that 90% of all new data is created in these most recent two years. And then, you know, so you guys have to be looking at basically the end of projecting towards like the end of 2020 as you're trying to make the next book. Yeah, the, the best aspects of visualizing change are the ones that are, um, are either timeless. So like we did a couple things that are historical, right? So those are timeless. Thank God, right? Mm -hmm. Other things that are projecting the future out to something like 2030, like some of those things are pretty good too. But anything that's talking about data this year, last year, last couple of years, it all feels 100% out of date right now when I read through it, which is why we decided not to print additional copies of it. Um, but yeah, it's all driven by the speed of technological change is definitely one aspect of it. Um, I think also having data from two years ago or even one year ago is just not optimal if you're trying to make decisions about something. You, and, and also the trends and the focuses that, um, that people care about have changed a little bit too, right? The, um, the zeitgeist, I guess you, you could describe it as like the, the feeling of what's important and what's not important. I think there's certain aspects of the book that I already feel a couple years down the line are not as important as they were at that time. And so how do you, how do you, when you're a data focused company, how do you, and each thing is something that can go out of date, how do you um, navigate that, right? It's an interesting question, which in the next book that we do, um, I think we're going to be trying to optimize for that, which is like, how do we focus on data that's going to be relevant for the next five years? Yes. And, um, and, and there are projections out there done by a lot of great, um, organizations and companies that I think are they could lend that data to us that I think would be good for accomplishing that so look forward to the next challenge and we knew this would be a challenge with our first book as we put it together we knew oh man this is going to feel out of date in five years for sure yeah. but it actually felt it is like only a couple of years before it fell out or felt out of date so that's mind-boggling to me now let's have you give a couple examples of what is um, data that is uh, historically timeless that you're able to visualize and then versus data that um, is uh, 2016, 17, 18, even 19 esque data. Um, we see this today where it's very almost obsolete in a sense to be talking about what was happening with um, the social media companies and the election and all that type yep. of stuff. It's already kind of like, ah, let's what's happening now um, versus what is being projected out to like 2030s where everyone's talking about everyone's going to have AR glasses. We're all going to be connected to 5G all time, blah, blah, blah. So how do you guys yet? Yeah, let's talk about those three different categories. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So one of the most interesting um, things when you're looking back at this previous book that we did and some of the data sets that I think have not been timeless. Um, one of them that really stands out is we have a visualization in there about the number of ICOs for cryptocurrency that occurred over the course of, I don't know, maybe it was over 2017 or 2018 or whenever there was sort of that boom happening. And now not only is, like the feeling about crypto is already different, right? People are thinking about the blockchain, but they're thinking about the blockchain in terms of like, um, how it's going to uh, affect the future of business and society and not as much about the investment side of all these ICOs happening and, and people throwing money in this new, the, a new white paper for a new cryptocurrency and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's kind of just disappeared off the radar and not only is the, the ICO become less relevant now because of, um, of like token offerings and like, you know, the whole ecosystem has basically evolved. Um, so not only are they not happening, but they're not even really relevant anymore. And so then the question is, is like when you're looking back at this data from this, that particular year, is it, is it even useful at all anymore? It, unless if you're looking specifically at what happened that year, I don't think it's useful in any context. So, um, you know, that's an example of something that did not stand the test of time. And so it's like, okay, no more stuff like that, right? <laughs> Let's cut that in the next book. <laughs> but... Uh, when you look at something like, um, okay, so maybe uh, world debt 
um, showing that in terms of dollar terms and showing that in terms of uh, percentage uh, debt as a percent of GDP and, uh, and that kind of thing. World debt changes um, sort of fast, but not that fast. Um, whether it's, so we did one a couple years ago and it was at, so uh, government debt was at 60 trillion. We did it this year and it was at up to 69 trillion. So yeah, there's a difference there over the two or three years, but it's not a game changing difference. And then when you look at debt uh, to GDP of different countries, there's a couple of countries that change, but for the most part, you know, the U.S. is hanging at 104% uh, uh, debt to GDP. You know, other um, Western nations are around the amount that they were at before. Japan is still the biggest in terms of debt to GDP. So you, when you look at all these things, they haven't really changed that much over that period of time. So something like that, I would be a lot more confident. You know, make sure that we're getting the very latest data before publishing. And then when, if you look at that three years from now, four years from now, it's still going to be approximately the same. Um, unless some cataclysmic world event happens where it changes that, right? So in instances like that, you can be a little bit more sure um, that it's going to be the same. So, and then here's the thing is if you're talking about something that's fast moving like crypto and you're talking about something that's slower moving like debt, how do you capture something that's fast moving but, um, but, you, you, can, but you can still timeless and you can yeah. still predict out that's going to be interesting? Mm -hmm. So that's the toughest area to deal with. Mm. Um, so with something like that, I mean, you really have to be looking at, I guess, you have to be able to have, um, I guess, like historical precedence for something like that um, happening and, and like a comparison that um, you're, you're looking at this topic and you're like, yeah, I can see that growing and growing and growing. So cannabis is an interesting one, right? So cannabis is interesting in that like alcohol, it had a period where you weren't allowed to buy or sell any, right? Um, it, which obviously that happened a lot earlier for, for in, uh, the alcohol uh, situation, but it is analogous to the cannabis situation in that it was um, black market for a long time and then it all of a sudden emerged into a legal market, or it's emerging into a legal market. And so there is some precedent there and uh, and you can make that comparison back to uh, to booze and you know the uh, the early 1900s and, and that kind of stuff. So stuff like that is interesting in that you know you, it's emerging, it's it's emerging, it's new, it's going to be a, a big difference maker in terms of um, it's going to have an impact on the world. But it's when you look at it, you have the feeling that it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to it's going to keep it's going to it's not going to disappear off the face of the earth like ICOs did. It's going to uh, keep going and it's going to follow that historical precedent in some shape or form uh, where it's going to, you know, as as uh, society continues to become more accepting of it, um, as governments are pressured to be forced to um, be more accepting of cannabis use and things like that, like it's hard to see that momentum reversing direction, right? Mm -hmm. What would have to happen for it to reverse direction? Something crazy would have to happen, right? So I think something like that is a, is a good example of something that's not only um, you know emerging, but it's also something that is unlikely to revert Reverse. or disappear. I, I like how um, one of your sweet spots that you're listing for us here is the ability to identify what is. Uh, a prominent emerging market that's catalyzing serious business and technology change around our world. <clears throat> Yet, yeah, like you said, is not easily going to be reverted. Uh, and that uh, how do you find then uh, the most important points around an emerging market like cannabis um, to show? and to uh, inspire people to get involved with, awaken to and involved with, um, to try and get, again, the fruits democratized to many people. Um, and that does seem like a, a really important way to, to, to be able to build the future of visual capitalist. Um, so you, gave, we, you were giving us the example of books. That's a, that's, that's a really big one. Um, the, um, the, 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 how often are you publishing um, one of these uh, um, these really strong syntheses and visualizations? Um, 
are do you, are you guys um, on all of your subsections? You have so many subsections mm-hmm. on Visual Capitalist. Are are they? Is there like an equal distribution to a post in all of those every you know every, at least every week or every couple of days? Or and then how often are they being blasted out in the mailing list? Um, and then we'll also hit on the venture cap or the Visual Capitalist Plus as well. We'll talk about that. Sure. So right now we publish one thing a day. Uh, our goal is to publish four things a day or five things a day to build our, our way up to that. Um, we also want to divide things upon a, we're thinking a North America and international spectrum uh, in terms of the content that we publish as well. And for now we publish one thing a day and we email it out once a day. Mm-hmm. And that is enough work for <laughs> 21 people, yeah. uh, which is, um, which, which speaks to the amount of effort that goes into producing these things. Yes. But, um, and it also speaks to the effort that will be involved in order for us to scale to four or five things a day. I, I don't think that we can become um, a source of news or, or media that is going to be hitting tens of millions of people unless we're hitting a wider variety of topics, unless we're hitting with, uh, there's more quantity to what's being published. Um, and so, and, and you also have to have those big, r- really crazy projects in there as well that are just like you look at and you're like, how did they put this together? Because this is so much information. So, you know, um, those really like uh, moonshot kind of projects. Um, and right now it's hard for our team to have the capability to do some of those. Um, but we want to do things like that as we grow and scale as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to take a lot more effort and a lot more um I think solidifying our processes and, and just like what you stated at the beginning, which is like, how do we actually find things that are um, worthy of being put in this format? I, I think that's probably the hardest question because whenever we hire someone new on our content side, they think, oh, maybe this will work or maybe this will work. And a lot of the time their, um, their instincts aren't necessarily in the right, they're like, they're close to the right place, but they're not necessarily in the right place. And so how do we find a way to guide people to that um, and, and how do we, and, and part of our mission as well, um, which I don't, I don't think that we talked about, um, but I think is relevant, is that we want to take our ability to uh, simplify complex information and we want to teach the rest of the world how to do that. Let's talk about that, I yeah. love that. Okay, so what we're doing uh, in addition to um, you know scaling out and building out what we're doing and the, the VC Plus, which is our um, sort of like premium extension beyond our like normal stuff is we're also going to be building something called it's tentatively called Visual Capitalist University, mm-hmm. which is way too grand and way too fantastic <laughs> for what it will actually be. So I, I mean, maybe it will grow into that eventually, yeah, right? Yeah. But what we really want to do is we ass- we want to build um, a foundation of knowledge so that anyone can say, okay, I have all this information, but how do I turn it into something that's compelling, that gets eyeballs, that allows people to um, to simplify this complex topic. I think that's something that can use, be used by companies, organizations, individuals, nonprofits. Everybody in today's information age and in today's um, you know, media uh, climate where there's just so much stuff, uh, so much content being churned out every single day and there's so much clutter there and so much information. Um, I think that it's something that really could help people figure out how to take things to the next level in terms of getting their story out, getting their information out. And if we can leverage that, um, not we visual capitalists, but society, if we can leverage these techniques amongst a broader, uh, other types of information, stuff that we don't cover, and get that out to people just as efficiently, I think that's going to be a huge step forward in terms of helping people understand more, helping people cut through that clutter of, I mean, when I look at my social feeds every day, it's a disaster, right? Disaster. I'm just like, I yeah. don't want any part of this. Yes. Uh, luckily, I have geared my following, the people that I follow on places like Din, to other people that do great stuff similar to what we're doing. So I do find really good stuff in there too. Uh, but it's still, um, it's still such a tough environment. And I can only imagine if, um, if for example, you live in an area where you don't, uh, you don't know interesting people or you don't know people that are talking about the things that are happening mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you haven't moved beyond that sort of local 
scene of people around you. Um, and for some people, that maybe that's what they like, but other people might just never have the opportunity to find out what's happening in the rest of the world, which is what, you know, why I'm a big fan of things like traveling and, yes. and experiencing new things and you know, all the things that I'm sure that you're a fan of. But some people in their information feed, they aren't able to venture out of their bubble either. Yes. And that's unfair to them that they can't see things from other sources and use, um, use their judgment, use their uh, problem solving abilities um, to parse this information and understand what's real and what's not real and to, and to learn about the world from not just one perspective. Uh, so there's a real challenge there and, and, uh, and coinciding with that, um, something that we did talk about briefly before this conversation is there's all kinds of media and news deserts out there as yeah. well. Um, locally in, um, in North America, all of the local news sources have all been, um, well, they've all been struggling because of uh, Facebook and Google taking their ad money, basically, right? So they've all been consolidating and all been being bought up by the same people. And now there's a lack of diversity, a lack of independent sources. Uh, and then, of course, that uh, also uh, happens on the, the rest of the, the media side, too, right? Um, all of uh, business media or all of news media, all, all of these, there, there's a lack of... Um, or, or there are independent sources, but they're not prominent enough yet. Uh, and, and we need to get people out of their bubbles and to see a range of opinions. We need to get them thinking critically about um, what, are, what are your beliefs and how do they compare to all these other beliefs. Uh, we need to get people not worked up about hearing beliefs from another side of the spectrum. Because uh, I think that's the gut reaction for a lot of people and a lot of smart people that I know right now, right? They hear an idea from a different side of the spectrum and they are like, oh my goodness, like, how could anyone ever think that that's the right thing to do, right? And I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of people and a lot of people have different values and like you really have to understand these different value systems and things. So it's, uh, it's an interesting landscape, but, uh, but our place in that is, you know, our small place in that is trying to do what we can with data to help build that out. So people do see those different sides, like, cause data yes. doesn't, the data doesn't lie, right? Um, so to build out some of those things so people can have that foundation and, and hopefully we can start teaching other people how to do that too. I really love this um, last bit on the uh, Visual Capitalist University. Um, it's probably um, going to make significant waves um, with the overall uh, uh, enlightenment and awareness shift around our world and the transition from uh, heavy noise ridden content uh, that is falling into tribalism and cognitive ease into more of the um, visualizing and storytelling of data that um, captures people's attention and hearts uh, towards harmony, towards peace, towards uh, prosperity for all. Um, I love that aspect and it's great because it's the tool and um, we've talked about this with Ed Boyden on the show and so many other prominent scientists and people at the edge of their fields is that it's actually super important that when you get to an edge of something like data visualization and storytelling that if you can take and compact a tool and then share that with the world at large. Absolutely. Then it makes it so that everyone can then come on board, uh, use that tool and start pushing the edge further in all of their respective domains as well. And um, I really like this a lot. And um, it is, it's gonna be part of that tool is gonna be the ability for people to share uh, <clears throat> uh, nuance and gray area um, but also in their ability to story tell um, data that lands in people's factual logical brains but also in their hearts and emotions um, brings those pieces together um, uh, the, uh, across all of the different ways that you can actually visualize it as well the, the visualizing um, the data and having these great like for me it's something along the lines of how can how can uh, an average person um, takes something like a unique piece of data um, and then be able to almost in a sense just um, have a bunch of maybe 
uh, AI created permutational designs of how that data could look and then uh, pick which one they think is going to land in the hearts and minds of people around the world. Um, could it be that easy that I'm that I'm that I myself am um, am submitting uh, something like I mentioned on the show earlier in our conversation, just like this idea of you know species amnesia and only recently discovering a hundred years ago this idea of a code of Hammurabi and how you know the primordial constitutions and how archaeologically we could find so many more of those and so maybe this thing that I want to share with people is about how there's so much opportunity for us archaeologically around the planet to find these things and so where are the next destinations that we need to go where have the where is the concentration and it seems like a big concentration has been in this area of like the fertile crescent in mesopotamia so you know maybe we do want to double or triple down on our efforts in those areas but then like the the amazon has another big you know or, or like these areas of the 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 coastal like cliffs uh, go back like tepe and things Gobekli like that too. Tepe. Yeah. yep yep very aware i love that one as well so yeah so that's just the general idea then is um how can we disseminate that in an image that inspires and in a in a post that inspires people to want to um uh, awaken to the potential of figuring out how our species even got here and we you know and what you mentioned earlier too about the uh, the the median age of, of Africa being 18, when the imagination creativity gets unleashed, uh, how can they have a tool like um, Visual Capitalist University to be able to disseminate? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, I mean, I, I think that the area that we can cover is only so small in the grand scheme of things, right? On the archaeological side of things, on areas like that, you know, I'm interested in those, but we're not experts in those fields. So we need people in those fields to take our skill set, the things that we've learned, which we want to teach people. We need them to take those skills and apply them to their individual fields, right? So we want, um, I mean, ideally, um, you have people that are at the best in all of their respective categories taking these communication skills that, that we're um, going to be teaching and apply them to their fields so that they reach more and more people. And you yeah. know, we can we can speak to the the business and investing side of that, but that's only such a small side of the of society, right? So, um, you know, we we obviously can't cover everything. We've dabbled in a bunch of different areas, but um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be better at teaching these things, right? And in science, right? Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. we touch on some of the technologies that we think will influence the future as far as um, where, where growth will be and, and things like that. Um, but the, the explaining things like, um, I, I mean, going into the... Uh, Genetic engineering. Sure, or, or, yeah. Or, or like going like the subatomic level sure. and all these kinds of things where it's like, I don't understand how any of that stuff works. I mean, like I, I'm interested in it, but I'm not going to be the one to explain it to anybody. Um, so I, I think that that's all stuff that we can, people that if they have the right skill set and if they learn what we now know and we're, we're trying to, we're trying our best to, to codify it and, and to make it so it's a system rather than just, um, you know, one or two people's intuitions, right? Um, and and if, we, if we can do that effectively, then all these other uh, groups of people can take this and apply it, so. Imagine how much faster we could get to the second quantum computing revolution if quantum mechanics was able to be disseminated in a way that leveraged Correct. visual capitalist university skills. Correct. Yeah, I, like, I love stuff like that. Thinking about that is so powerful. How much faster can we push the edge and advance society in these great directions? And also um, archaeologically, like figure out where we came from and be able to show that to people more effectively to inspire them to want to double down on research in these areas and stuff like that. Um, uh, okay, so Jeff, let's ask you about, um, you guys have, um, uh, a majority of the business is sustained. How, how have you guys been able to grow to a team of 21? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So primarily we're, um, an ad driven media company. So like any media company, uh, well, at least up until... Recently, uh, most media companies are driven by ads. So 
um, whether you're the um, the New York Times or whether you're Forbes or or whatever, like all of these groups had a large component of their uh, revenue derived from ads. Um, so on our end, what we do is we um, we have two types of ads. We have um, native advertisements, and we also have uh, an area called the company spotlight. Um, and so basically, these are ways to showcase companies that fit within the um, the areas of things that we're talking about, right? Yep. So, like for example, if we're talking about augmented reality as an investing opportunity, and we're saying, yeah, this is actually a really interesting space. Our salespeople will find an augmented reality company that wants to profile themselves on the site, yep. and so we'll have a separate page for them. It's you know, it's not something that is in the editorial feed or anything like that. It's just a separate page. We build them a really nice graphic that explains what they're about. And we, we give them that landing page so that people can learn more about them if they want to. And that's a paid thing yep, uh, where yep. we're generating income from it. Um, the and then, company spotlight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so and then what okay. we'll also do is like through our daily email blast or something like that, we will throw in an ad to direct people to that spotlight to learn more about that exactly. company. Yeah. Um, one more nuanced way that we, um, we also generate revenue is we will partner with um, people that we consider to be thought leaders. Um, so we've partnered with Tony Robbins in the past. That's great. To take his book. So he did a book um, on uh, finance and investing. Yeah. And so he, uh, his team reached out to us and said, you know, it'd be great if you took seven chapters of our book and you visualized them. That's great. And so what we did is we, we found the most compelling aspects of each of these chapters. We visualized them. Uh, we published them. And of course, when we publish them, we're linking back to the to book. The book. Yeah. So it kind of ends up like the ideal situation there is um, it's a win-win-win, right? For us, it's good engaging content, it's revenue. For them, it's a way to showcase their ideas in a meaningful way. It's coming from an authority, someone that people know who he is, they respect him. And for our audience, they're learning something and getting value out of it as well. And if they find that valuable, then they might find his book valuable as well. Yeah. So you're connecting all of these dots in a really useful win-win-win way. Um, and it's the same thing when we work with someone like, um, like McKinsey is a good example of that too, right? They put out, they have all these PhDs and the, you know people that are putting together this massive amount of research. But as I say, um, a 200-page document is only going to be useful to so many, a very small spectrum of people, right? And so if we can find a way to um, take that information and parse it and find what's interesting out of it and publish it and say, hey, these are the key insights from this report, and you guys might be interested to learn them. And if you want more, you can go here. You know, that's another way that um, I think is a win-win-win a where everybody gets value out of that, right? Yeah. So that would be another way that we do it. And then uh, finally, uh, recently we've launched something called VC Plus. Uh, and of course, VC University would be in this category too of like yeah. something that outside of the advertising realm that people would, um, we will have aspects of VC University that would be free. And then of course, we'd have access, uh, aspects of it that would be paid where you can dive deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. So that would pay for us like making that content. Um, but VC Plus, is uh, basically a, a subscription service that's uh, monthly. It's five dollars and seventy-three cents U.S. a month, and it's basically for people that want uh, the level beyond what we currently give out on the on the free side of things. So our our main business will always be that free ad-driven model, so that everybody can get our information and everybody can get our data. But for VC Plus members, we go sort of an extra step of of getting them involved. So we will be engaging them, talking about them, what do you want to see more of, what do you, what do you want to learn more of. Um, we'll, we'll be doing stuff like going behind the scenes and showing them like how we actually might work on a project. So like later this week, we're going to be talking about something that we first published you know, four or five years ago and it's evolved over time as we, we publish a new version every couple of years. We're going to show them why and how it evolved over time and what decisions we made. And, and they're going to look at that and, and they're going to be able to get an extra aspect of uh, context there that other people won't get. Um, but I think that uh, I think that will provide value to some people. Uh, and then we also round up uh, our, our top um, editorial picks each week of different other visualizations outside of our site that we think are really interesting or compelling. And so our editors each week will each submit a list of things that they found really compelling. And you know that because it's coming from our team that it's, they're going to be you know, quality data-driven visualizations that are going to be powerful and, and capture people's attention. So we put those all on a list and we send them out every Sunday for VC Plus subscribers. 
I love the um, the ways of being able to uh, take what you're doing and and uh, and create uh, models of of sustaining um, and growing what you're doing that are like you said win 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 models that are um, models around um, the continued uh, inspiration and awakening of of people to really important. Um, knowledge. I'm, 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 I'm happy that you guys have figured, um, and we, uh, our show still has to figure out really good ways like that um, uh, as well. I, I'm, I'm, I wonder how many more opportunities exist like that that we still have to um, figure out where a, a, kind of like a bigger dog can come in like a McKinsey or a Robbins and can say, hey, are you guys interested in taking what we're doing and compressing it um, visually? Uh, yeah, I like stuff like that. That's really interesting. Um, I want to ask you some of the questions that we ask on the program that um, that are really tough philosophically, spiritually. Um, do you think that we're all one? You want to give... Okay, so that might be a common question asked in these circles, but maybe can you elaborate on that a little bit? So if you're, if you're pro all one side, what, 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 what are most people thinking if you're... Anti, we're all one side. What is the what is the general thing? Because I can I can throw my answer in the context of that. So, are we all one? Do we all come from the same source? Are we all interconnected? Um, is there really no separation? Um, whether you want to call it God or the universe or the multiverse or whatever you want to use as, as the words, um, do we all come from one, and are we all one? Well, I think we're all interconnected, but that's just a, f that's just a fact of reality, right? Because uh, when you look at um, complex systems and things like that, right, um, you have to be connected, right? Because the air that I'm breathing is literally the same air that you're breathing. Um, the you know, or the classic example of a butterfly flapping its wings in one place is going to determine something somewhere else. I mean, there's all of these um, intercurrents happening all the time between not only people, but everything else, every other object, right? Um, and that's just, a f that's just a physical uh, fact, basically, right? Because um, everything that you do is going to, unless it's, and even if it is done in isolation, it's ultimately going to um, impact someone else, right? Because, uh, if you if you s stayed in your apartment all day and you did not interact with the outside world at all, that's going to actually affect your family and the friends that you had made before that, and that impact on them is going to impact other people, right? Because they're going to be sadder or they're going to be what? So all of any action you take is going to be it, it as a fact is interconnected with everybody else. Uh, when you look at it from a more um, base level perspective of like. Um, are we all uh, the same? Are we? Do we all have that common? Um, I guess I, I think we all have common heritage. Uh, all the same species, all coming from the same place. Um, but today, I, I, I think that there's a sense that we you need to look out for everybody else, and you need to be you need to be cognizant of. Other people and what they're going through. I don't. I don't know if I would say that we're all literally one conscience or some or one you know um, group in that way, though. Yeah, I like feeling into uh, your process of going back and seeing that the lineage goes to right. one. Yeah. So that I 100% agree with, right? Um, because we all stemmed from the same uh, root, right? So in that way and in the way that I described in terms of like physically being, everyone is interconnected in that way, I think in those ways I think it totally makes sense that we're one. Um, I'm not so sure on a, on a more, um, I, I guess, conscious level of like uh, thoughts are all coming from the same place or interacting with one another. Um, I think there is your thoughts are definitely changing me live. That's that's fair, yeah. but that is also the business that we're in. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who aren't in that in that. That's not their focus of life, right? So, 
Whether uh, they're aware of it or not, though, every single moment of stimuli that we're taking in is changing. It's true. Uh, and so, so that, is, that is the interconnectedness that I do think exists. Um, but that has a lot to do with consciousness. That has a lot to do with our physiology. Sure. Yeah. Our neurology. Yeah. Yeah. Is then the most upstream issue that we face our feelings of separation and our lack of feelings of interconnectedness? I think in modern society that this is a this is a concerning trend that you know we are more connected than ever but less connected than ever at the simultaneously right it's a paradox right um, you can send information to any almost anybody in the world in the blink of an eye and you can you know we have um, we have people on our we have people on our site from North Korea like four people every year <laughs> I guess that's how many people have internet access there um, but uh, so you know you have this ability to connect and interact with people all over the globe uh, which is pretty crazy but at the same time uh, I think there is a pervasive sense of loneliness felt throughout as well and so this is a, a big paradox that um, you know, we have to find a way to, to solve. Um, and, I, and I think that tying into that paradox as well is uh, a lot of the, I, I think a lot of the things that you guys touch on and, and some of the things we touched on here around information as well, because it's not only, you're, you're at the same time you're connected to all of the information in the world, yet paradoxically people are in more bubbles than they've ever been before. Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing, right? It's the same thing as, personal connection. I have more personal connection to anyone else in the world, but uh, you know, people are feeling lonelier. But at the same time, on the information side of things, you're connected to more information. Like On your phone, you have all of humanity's information in one place. That's crazy. Yet, people are in bubbles and seem to know less about what's going on outside of those bubbles than they ever have in the past. Uh, so that's a paradox as well. And so, what do we do about those? I, I mean, I know what we're doing about that second paradox. Um, we're trying to get information out in, in ways that I think can help open up those bubbles a little bit. Um, on the personal side, on the connectedness side, I, I don't know. I, I mean, that, but I think those two things tie in together. Yeah. And then what do you think is the point of this reality? Uh, I, I think that there is, I don't think there is a point. You don't think there's you don't think there's any purpose at all to this being created. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's what you make of it. If you were making this reality, what could you see as the point? of you making it be? If I made the reality, um, that is a, a really great question. I think that for me, um, I, I think it would be something along the lines of um, making sure that everybody is free in the most um, in the most like expansive definition of that term imaginable so not just free as in like political freedom or economic freedom or something like that but free to do anything that you choose um, in terms of like being able to accomplish the things that you want to do to chase after the things that you're most interested in, to travel to where you want to go, um, to uh, experience experiences that um, maybe you couldn't before. Um, so that is something that interests me. I do not think that that is the point of reality, but I think that that's my, part of my personal mission within this reality as far as I see myself. And so if I were creating reality, uh, I would I would be um, hugely biased in creating it in something that uh, 
fits upon that kind of spectrum of things. I love your focus on degrees of freedom and just the word free. I like that a lot for self-actualization. Exactly. For, um, your and for no one to tell you what you should self-actualize. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're free to choose if you want to become the best writer, the best spiritual teacher, the best scientist, whatever the thing is, is that you want to actualize yourself in doing, you can do that. I think that that would be pretty cool. For you to be fully sovereign in your own adventure of consciousness. Exactly. Yeah. I love it, Jeff. Thanks so much for coming on to the program and sharing with us what you guys are doing. I'm a huge fan and I'm really grateful that you came on. Thank you. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about all the great things that Jeff was sharing with us. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Check out all of the links in the bio below to visualcapitalist.com. Also, their profiles on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Also, Jeff's profile on LinkedIn. Go and follow them and go and share their content with your friends and families. Have more discussions online about the concepts that they're teaching and make it a common thing to try and yourself compress really important data and share that with the world. Also, check out the links in the bio below to our show simulation help support us and to continue doing cool things like coming on site to great places like Vancouver to have epic conversations with people like Jeff. Support us on PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency, you can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are in the bio below. Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap. Cool, man. That was awesome. That was really solid. Thank you. Whoa. Yeah, that was great. We went into a lot of epic places.